Hi, I'm Mike Farrington. Welcome back to the boardroom. In this video, I'm going to turn this giant slab of walnut into a desk. I get started by making a cardboard template that I drop off at the client's house just to make sure that we've got the size right. I grab some of my third favorite cleaner, Ace Tone, and clean off some thick walled steel tube and steel plate. The base of this desk will be made from steel. I use thick material to add weight. A nice desk should be good and heavy, right? This saw has a carbide tip blade, and it does a nice job of cutting clean, accurate cuts. And it keeps the material cool so it can be handled as soon as the cut is complete. This is my version of a quick and dirty metal cutting chop saw station. I clamp the saw down to the bench as well as some 2 by material for a stop. So after rough cutting parts oversized, this setup allows me to cut the four vertical and two horizontal leg pieces to consistent length. I cut the steel plate in two passes. I cut as far as I can on the first pass, flip the piece, and finish the cut from the other side. With all the pieces cut to length, I chamfer the edges in preparation for welding. Now it's time to tack weld the legs together. I get everything set just right, then start off with a mistake. I put two tack welds on the miters, which prevent me from making adjustments. When welding heat causes things to warp and therefore pull out a square. So by just having one tack at each corner, this allows for some wiggle room as the assembly is coming together. After tacking the miters together, I tack the legs to the steel plate and check for square often. At this point, the leg assemblies are fully tack welded together and ready for mock-up. Here I'm demonstrating a very special and ancient warm-up routine that helps me build the courage to bifurcate a piece of lumber that costs more than I make in a month. I only get one shot at this. After a successful cut, I wipe the sweat from my brow, breathe a sigh of relief, and put the slab on the legs to make sure that things look nice. I sent a couple progress pictures, or pics as the kids call them, to the customer for approval. Once approved, I finish welded all the joints. After the welds cooled off, I moved on to the grinding phase. And since I'm not the best welder in the world, grinding took me a mere 9,424 hours to complete. I mixed up some Bondo and smeared it on to really smooth things out. By the way, Bondo is my second favorite schmear behind cream cheese. I also put a little on the seam of the tube. I was able to flatten the edges of the Bondo with the random orbit. To get a consistent round over, or is it a round under, I use this round rubber sanding block thingy. I 
I sanded all surfaces with 60 grit sandpaper to make sure that the texture is consistent and ready for paint. The legs are ready for primer and paint. However, I'm waiting for delivery of said primer and paint, so I turn my attention back to the top. I set it on my CNC and assess the surface to figure out exactly how to position the slab to get it flat, but leave it as thick as possible. The first thing I notice is at one end, there's a pretty big lip, which crunks up my ability to measure. So I establish a center line with a level. From there, I can mark a perpendicular line to help guide my cut. I check my line relative to the other end cut, and I'm within about a quarter of an inch. These aren't final cuts, so that's close enough. Once the end has been cut, I'm able to really measure and mark exactly where the CNC will need to cut down to to achieve a flat surface. Here, as I'm gluing down a shim, you can see the various marks on the end grain where I've played around with shim combinations to give me the best yield. The shims prevent the slab from wobbling, and I add some plywood blocks to prevent the slab from moving during the cut. Once word got out that I have a CNC that can flatten slabs, I've been doing a lot of what? Slab flattening. So I invested in a router bit with rotatable cutters. Note the small contact point. This keeps the bit cooler and therefore lasts longer. I set the cutting depth manually based on what I think is the highest point on the slab. I take a careful first pass and assess the results. After that, it's just a matter of rinse and repeat the program until the whole surface has been machined. In this case, I cut the top first. So when done, I flip it over and I do the same to the bottom. Along the way, I like to check progress and how much more needs to be cut and from where. In this case, I found the dip at the end was really going to cut into the overall slab's thickness. So I decided to do a quick epoxy pour in that one area. This patch will really disappear when it's all said and done because we're gonna use a dark oil finish, which tends to make end grain really dark, thereby hiding the glue line. I hot glue a dam in place, mix up some epoxy, and add some black dye. I let that dry overnight and run the flattening program one last time at the depth of the last pass. This cleanly cuts off any protruding epoxy. I figured this is as good a time as any to do the final end cuts. This allows me to move on to the next step, which is cut some pockets for the legs to fit into. I start by making a routing jig. I make this jig about a quarter inch bigger in both directions than the top plate of the legs, just to give some wiggle room. I measure in from my cleanly cut ends and mark the location of the pocket to be cut. I fully realize that I could have cut these on the CNC machine, but I wasn't confident in my ability to get the pockets in the right place. So while doing it by hand is messy, it felt like the safer bet. After hogging out the material in the center, I switch to a top bearing bit, follow the edge of the template. This leaves me with a perfectly pocketed pocket. After confirming that the fit is good, it's time to drill some holes in the top plate. 
I got the idea for this wide top plate from my good buddy John Malecki, who, by the way, is way better at karaoke than you would think. The idea being, make it nice and wide, drill holes towards the outside edges, and this will prevent the desk from racking without the use of a center stretcher between the two legs. With the holes drilled, I mark for the locations of some threaded inserts I'm going to use. The threaded inserts are used because they make a really good connection with the wood, and it makes it easy to take the table apart and put it back together. I got this idea from John as well. So to give you an idea how non-racky the desk is, if that's a word, I bolted the legs on and took the old hand plane to the top. I can say with complete confidence that this sucker is rock solid and would make a pretty good workbench if one was so inclined. Quick progress shot, looking pretty spiffy. There were a few small knots to deal with. I filled them with some more epoxy. Of course, all projects need some surface prep. I use a card scraper on the knots. I do this because it speeds along the sanding process. Follow that up with some sanding. I use a steel bristle brush to clean and slightly smooth all the live edges, and of course I ease all the sharp corners. Back to the legs, I decided to cut a hole to gain access to the leg tube. This way I could hide the wires from the outlets that will be installed in the top. This was a total pain in the rear, but it ended up working out fine. The next tedious task was to drill a hole in the bottom of the leg so the plug wire could pop out. This was a little easier. I bought a fresh hole saw of the correct size and it cut like butter through the steel. The last detail I needed to do was to cut a channel for the wires to come over from the outlets that will be drilled into the top and have a path into the hollow of the leg. So I make up a quick jig, stick it down with carpet tape and bust out the mighty router. Here's the end result, a neat and tidy way to channel the wires into the leg. Shifting gears, I spray some primer on the legs. This is a two-part epoxy primer, and I was super impressed with this stuff. Uh, it sprayed easy enough and sanded really nice when it was dry. Once the primer was dry, I switched to top coat mode. This stuff is a two-part catalyzed urethane from Eastwood, same company as the primer. It's super duper flat, the least amount of sheen I could find. It sprayed easy and certainly was a flat sheen. The drawback to these coatings is they dry slow, which leaves an opening for dust to fall into the finish. So I vac off my clothes, I spritz the floor with water to keep dust down, spray and walk out the door for the day. And here's the third finish for this project, Rubio Mono Coat, or as I like to call it, Rubio Duo Coat, because it takes two coats to make things look right. This is their walnut color. I pour some on sparingly and use a Bondo spreader to smear it around. Then I buff off any excess uh, with a terry cloth bonnet.
The final detail is to cut the holes for the three power grommets. This took me a while to build up the courage to start the cuts, of course. I did a quick mock-up using some zero clearance inserts from my bandsaw. Once satisfied, I measured and used my auto punch to give the pilot bit of the hole saw a firm place to start. Maybe it's time for a song recommendation. Story of My Life by Social Distortion. A song I liked in high school, but only now as a man of advanced age do I understand. For a little extra credit, Social D does the best cover ever of Johnny Cash's Ring of Fire, period. Check those out if you feel the need to rock. Last detail is to bore out some space for the nuts that hold the grommets in place. I decided to add one final coat of finish. This is Rubio's Maintenance Oil. After buffing off the maintenance oil, it was time for final assembly. I had to come up with a way to hold the table so that I could fish the wires down the leg, then slide the leg under the table. Here's what I came up with. Fishing the wires down the leg was easy enough, but the trick was to zip tie them so that as I pushed them down the leg, there wasn't slack hanging down. This took me a couple of tries to get right, but once done, it did give a clean look. Loaded the desk into the mighty van and headed out for delivery. While not super heavy, the desk weighed maybe 250-ish pounds, so I called upon my good buddy Josh to help with delivery. One last buffing to remove any fingerprints. This is one of those non-abrasive pads. I plugged the desk in and it's ready to go. Side note, this plug is gonna be moved over towards the leg at some point. Overall, I think it turned out great. You gotta admit, a seven and a half foot long, three foot wide piece of walnut is a beautiful thing. Special thanks to the client for commissioning this piece and allowing me to film. Building a piece like this is truly a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed following along. Thanks for watching. Till next time.